case, they don't regard it to be farad or wajib and anybody who doesn't do four months and 40 days is a kafir, nauzubillah, or a fasiq or whatever. This is encouragement. And just like it doesn't say in the hadith that you have to go to Medina University for four years to become a scholar. Some people have got serious problem with fazal amal There are fabricated stories. How do you know they are fabricated? And in any case, they're only stories. So when the Prophet's got no problem with accepting stories, then why have you got a problem? No one is asking you to base your aqidah on them, to base your ahkams or afraid and wajibat or rulings upon them. It's easy to point fingers at others, but when you point a finger at someone, there are three pointing back at you. So when we see faults in others, that means we ourselves have three times as many faults. So it's easy to point fingers at others, uh, but to show and do something practically, uh, these brothers, Allahu Akbar, uh, from the east to the west and the north and the south, Allahu Akbar, all over the world doing fundamental, basic, crucial, important work in bringing people back to deen. Allahu Akbar, everything in tabligh, if a person was sincere, Allahu Akbar, you will see the evidence in Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When people go in Jaman, uh, they are encouraged to learn everything. Uh, aqidah issues, fiqh issues, qiraat issues, all sorts of issues. Uh, but when they return from the khuruj and they go back to their own localities, learn from their own ulama. Because in khuruj there are people from all sorts of backgrounds. If you start discussing complicated issues, it causes problems. And many people in Jamaat are not ulama. So people haven't spared the Khulfa Rashidu, they didn't spare Rasulullah, and they haven't even spared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People are even critical of Allah. So just because someone is critical, it doesn't mean he's necessarily right. And after the Quran, probably Fazal Amal is the most read book in the whole world. People read it in every masjid almost, mashallah, in most houses it's read. And millions of people have benefited from reading Fazal Amal. Dear brothers and respected elders, we begin in the name of Allah and we thank Him and praise Him and glorify Him. Allah has given us a wonderful deen, deen of Islam. Allah Himself has perfected it and chosen it for us. In our deen, there are a lot of things, a lot of commands, a lot of rulings. And there are certain things which are fundamental and basic. Our deen is based on, on five issues. Our iman. To bear witness there is no God other than Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the messenger of Allah. And to establish salat, pay zakat, fast in the month of Ramadan, and to perform hajj if one can afford to do so. These are known as the fundamentals, the pillars of Islam. But the aim and the maqsad and the goal for this ummah uh, is, something, is something else. It's something far superior and very... and. Uh, a very critical issue, and that is, is da'wah. A da'wah is an obligation. Da'wah is also a responsibility for this whole ummah. The whole ummah is responsible, and every individual in the ummah is also responsible. وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ And this ummah is the best of the ummahs. And why? Because Allah has raised this ummah for the benefit of the whole mankind. Previously Allah used to send prophets uh, to guide people, to lead them to the right path. But because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the last of the prophets, no more prophet to come after Rasulullah. Hence Allah has transferred uh, that responsibility Allah used to bestow upon prophets uh, to this ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that this ummah will carry on the work of da'wah and this ummah will preach to the people and take deen to the far corners of the world, to the east and the west and the north and the south. And although Prophet wasallam has been sent and raised uh, for all the people of the world, all the humans, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَّةً لِلنَّاسِ For all the people of the world, and not just humans but also jinns. And jinns also believed in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when we see that the Prophet himself did not go outside the Arabian Peninsula, the furthest the Prophet himself went was to Tabuk. 
he was raised in Mecca, spent most of his life there, and then before Allah blessed him with the Nubuwat, he did travel to Sham. And, but then after Allah raised him as a prophet, he traveled once to Taif, then after migration, he traveled around Medina, and the furthest he went was Tabuk. It was then the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his, his time and, the, and in, in the time close to the time of the Prophet, the Sahaba initially, uh, they took the, the responsibility of this deen to far corners of the world. Then in the, in the years to come and in the period to come, centuries later, uh, Muslims have been traveling far and wide and spreading the message of Allah. Uh, so this Ummah has been raised uh, for the benefit of the mankind. And every individual in this ummah is responsible for the work of da'wah. Uh, hence many ulama, uh, they say that da'wah is fardi ayn. Fardi ayn means it's a responsibility and obligation on every individual. Like prayers are an obligation upon every individual. Fasting is, is ordained upon every individual. Zakat is ordained upon those who, 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 are, who have enough wealth upon which zakat becomes obligatory. 87.5 grams of gold or 613 grams of silver. And hajj is obligatory upon those uh, who can afford to do so. Man istata'a ilayhi sabila. There are certain things which are farda kifaya. Farda kifaya means if some people perform that action in a manner which suffices, on, then the whole community will be freed from the obligation. Otherwise the whole community will be, will be sinful. I like janazah salat. If a few people pray it, then that is sufficient. Everybody doesn't have to pray salatul janazah. Obviously, the more who who uh, who pray it is better, is better, more rewarding for the person who's deceased and for the people at large. But if just a few pray it, then this will suffice. Uh, just as in Ramadan, atikaf is sunnat muakkidatul kifaya. If a few people make a tikaf in Ramadan in the masjid, in the community, that suffices for the whole community. But if nobody performs it, then the whole community will be sinful. Uh, similarly, if da'wah, if da'wah is considered for the ayn in light of this ayat as it is, uh, this means every Muslim is required to perform da'wah. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِ أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ لَا بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Allah commands the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to say, and this is my path. Hadi sabili adu ilallah. I call people to Allah. Ala basiratin with insight, with thorough understanding. Ana, me, womanit tabani, and every one of my followers. Uh, this includes men. This includes women. This includes rich. This includes poor. This includes grown up. This includes young ones, and and rich and poor, public and rulers, the whole ummah. Anyone who claims to follow Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in light of this ayat, and then that is an obligation on every Muslim. There is no condition whether a person is scholarly or unscholarly, learned or unlearned. Some people think that you need to be a scholar in order to or an alim in order to do da'wah. Yes, if it is done with knowledge, it will be more fruitful and more productive and better. Uh, but that's not what the Quran says. Uh, if a person is of the opinion that the da'wah should only be done by scholars, then that is not what the Quran says. Uh, the Quran uh, places an obligation upon every individual who is a Muslim that they should do the work of da'wah. In another verse in the Quran, Allah says, وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ And there should be an ummah. An ummah isn't a small group. Ummah is, mashallah, as though the whole ummah should be involved. But the whole ummah, Allah says, وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ From amongst you. Ummatun, in other words, a large group. يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ Who are called to the good. So in light of this ayat, some ulama are of the opinion, if there are enough people doing the work of da'wah, that Islam is spreading and Islam is safe in the ummah as well. That the Muslims are secure and Islam is spreading, people are being introduced to Islam and the message is being taken and not just by a few individuals. It has to be taken by a large number of people that they can be considered ummah. And then perhaps it will suffice. 
But otherwise, it's an obligation upon every individual in this ummah to do the work of da'wah. And to encourage people and make people do something so important and in this manner. And you need to really give them incentive. And this is, so Allah has given the incentive to people, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ Whose word can be better than his who invites people to Allah? In other words, there is nothing better. And if a person is praying to Allah himself, very good. If a person is seeking knowledge, alhamdulillah, very good. Uh, but the best thing a person can do is to call people to Allah. And here, Allah doesn't say, uh, call people to Islam. وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ Allah doesn't say that. Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ Call to Allah. Here, mashallah, some mufassirin, some scholars have described, explained this rather uh, to mean, because some people might already be Muslims, they might be Muslims, but if they are negligent and not practicing, they also need da'wah. Uh, so they need to be encouraged to come close to Allah. They need to be encouraged to, be, be, to believe in Allah properly. And people, many, they claim to be believers. Allah has mentioned this in the Quran. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, aminu billahi wa rasulihi. O oh, you people who are believers, believe. In other words, a person might think he's a believer, but is he really a believer? Does he believe as he ought to believe? Uh, so, Ya ayyuhalladheena aminu, aminu billahi wa rasulihi. In other words, all those who think you believe, believe in Allah properly. So even people who are born Muslims, even they need da'wah. Uh, and there is further evidence from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For example, when adhan is called, uh, like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before and after most actions, he would recite du'as. When he would rise in the morning, he would recite a dua. Before food, he would recite a dua. After food, he would recite a dua. When leaving home, recite a dua. Coming back, back home, recite a dua. Entering the masjid, recite a dua. Leaving the masjid, recite a dua. And when the new moon is sighted, recite a dua, and so on. And similarly, after Adhan, the Prophet ﷺ has taught us a wonderful dua. And the dua begins, Allahumma rabba hadihi dawa titamma. Which means, oh Allah, this is the perfect call. When we see Adhan, who is the Adhan for? For non-Muslims? For Muslims. Because who is going to respond to the call of Adhan? To come and pray? Muslims. And not just ordinary Muslims, because in Islamic countries there is Adhan. So you see, not the whole community, the bazaar, the town doesn't come to the masjid. Uh, so who responds to the call of the prayer? The call to the prayer, those who are going to pray anyway. Uh, so they need adhan, as they need dawah as well. If people are in the masjid and it's time for adhan, for example in Ramadan. In Ramadan at iftar time, most people are in the masjid uh, to open their fast. So are you going to stop giving adhan because everybody's in the masjid? No, if people are already in the masjid, they still need dawah. What is adhan? Adhan is dawah. Allahumma rabba hadihi dawah tamma. This is the perfect call. Call for what? Call to Allah. And this is why Muaddin, when, when he begins Adhan, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He begins by glorifying uh, the greatness of Allah. So Muslims need Adhan, whether they be living in Makkah. Is it the same Adhan in Makkah? Whether they be in Algeria, Somalia, Pakistan, Morocco, England, America, Australia, wherever they are, same call, uh, same Adhan, same perfect Dawah. Everywhere, Makkah, Medina, Jerusalem, England, Pakistan, India, Somalia, Algeria, Morocco, America, Australia, everywhere, everybody needs Adhan. And those who are practicing Muslims, they need Adhan. Those who are in the masjid, they need Adhan. Even Imam of the masjid, he needs to hear the Adhan. Uh, so everybody needs Adhan and everybody needs Dawah. Uh, not just once a day, once a year. Uh, they need it every day and five times a day. Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wati tamma. So Muslims need in fact more da'wah than non-Muslims even. So Muslims need da'wah, Kafirs need da'wah, Kafirs need da'wah to encourage them to come to Islam. 
Muslims need da'wah uh, to encourage them to be better Muslims. Uh, and even good Muslims need da'wah to encourage them to become even better. Uh, so everybody needs da'wah. Allahu Akbar. And real da'wah and da'wah is something that the Prophet ﷺ, he performed. And this is one of the Prophet ﷺ's distinctive identities. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Ahzab, Ya ayyuhal Nabi, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadheera wa da'iyan ila Allahi bi idhnihi wa sirajan munira. Uh, o oh Prophet, I have sent you as a witness, as a giver, as a giver of glad tidings, Bashir, wa nadheer, as a warner, and wa da'iyan ila Allah, and as a caller to Allah. Bi'idhnihi, uh, with his will, with his permission, wasirajam munira, and you've been sent as an illuminated lamp. Uh, and when we look around, why do we light a lamp? For light. Uh, but a lamp uh, is not the brightest of, of light giving objects. When we look around, we see, we probably, you know, probably a bulb can give more light than a lamp. And certainly during the day, sun gives up the most light. And there has been no one to shine more brightly than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the whole history of humanity. So Allah doesn't compare the Prophet as a sun. Allah compares the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to a lamp. And the ulama have, have explained this and, and given the reasons. Although the sun is very bright, but you can't make another sun through the sun. Sun is there. It gives out light, a very powerful light, and, but you can't make another sun from the sun. Although lamp might not appear to give too much light, but the beauty of a lamp is you can light another lamp from a lamp. And then another one, then another one. You can light thousands and millions, and so much so there can be lamps in every house, and many lamps in every house. So the nur that the Prophet ﷺ brought, the lightness, the light, the nur which Rasulullah brought, uh, it's to be transferred from one person to another, to another, to another, to another, which can't be done by a sun or the moon, that can only be done effectively uh, like a lamp. Uh, so the Prophet ﷺ started giving da'wah, uh, and on his call, people like Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, accepted the Prophet's call. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, what an acceptance of call he, he showed. The Prophet said, whomsoever I have presented Islam, they've all hesitated and sought, except Abu Bakr. He responded instantaneously, as soon as I presented da'wah, he accepted it readily. And Abu Bakr ta'ala, his Islam and acceptance of Islam was also special uh, in a way that he didn't keep his Islam to himself. Uh, he then replicated himself and he presented Islam and took Islam to other people, his friends. People like Hazrat Usman, Saad bin Abi Waqas, Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, just as Rasulullah was the first da'i, but in the ummah the first da'i was Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the first person to give a public sermon, but in on, on Mount Safa. And but from the ummah the first person to give a public sermon again was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And then, uh, as, as, as well as not hesitating and, pres and uh, spreading da'wah, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah blessed him so much so, uh, that he also, whatever wealth Allah blessed him with, he started sp spending it upon Islam and upon the need of the Muslims and upon the desire and wish of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So Allah then blessed Abu Bakr in a manner uh, nobody else was blessed. The ultimate rank in this ummah, uh, the ultimate rank in this ummah is that of Sahaba. Allah mentions in the Quran, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah elevates those amongst you with iman and knowledge to lofty ranks. Uh, so the be among the best people in this ummah are those with knowledge and those with strong iman. Uh, but there is one rank which is even higher. And that is the rank of Sahabi. And no matter how knowledgeable a person is, and no matter how strong an iman of anybody is, and the status Allah will give to Sahaba 
it can't be matched. Uh, that is simply not attainable. Just as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is khatamun nabiyyin, no more prophet to come after him. Uh, so if there is no more prophet to come after him, so once the prophet left this world, similarly there will be no more sahaba after Rasulullah as well. People can become muhaddisun, mujtahids, fuqaha, whatever, uh, but no one can become sahabi anymore. The day Rasulullah left this world, whosoever was a sahabi, uh, that was it. And uh, just as the door of Nubuvat was closed, similarly the door to becoming a sahabi was also closed. Uh, Iman, people can carry on acquiring and people will become Muslims and carry on. And the door to knowledge is also open. But the door of Nubuvat is closed, and because the door of Nubuvat is closed, the door to Sahabiyat has also been closed. And Allah blessed Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Not only was he a Sahabi, and there were four generations of Sahaba in his family. He is the only Sahabi whose both parents were Sahaba, became Muslims and were Sahaba, himself Sahabi, all his children were Sahabi and his grandchildren were Sahabi as well. Uh, Abu Quhafa was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's father. He became a Muslim at the conquest of Mecca. His mother had become a Muslim already before Hijra. And then his, his children, Abdullah, Abdul Rahman, Allahu Akbar, and then Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha, and then Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Muhammad bin Abi Bakr was very young at the time when Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu left this world anyway. And so, and then from his grandchildren, uh, his, one of his sons was Abdul Rahman, his, one of his sons, his name was Abu Atiq. Allama Jalaluddin Suyuti Ramahullah has written this in Tariqul Khulafa. And then one of his grandsons from one of his daughters, Asma Abdullah bin Zubair, he was also a Sahabi Rasul. So four generations of Sahaba in one family, and Abu Bakr is the only person uh, with that honor. Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu is special, but Abu Talib wasn't a Muslim. Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu is, subhanallah, لو كان بعد نبيا لكان عمر بن الخطاب. If there was to be another prophet after him, it would have been Umar. Himself is Sahabi, his children are Sahabi, but his parents, uh, no. Uh, so Abu Bakr is the only person who was blessed by Allah in this manner. So I was saying Rasulullah is the first da'i, and from the Ummah, the first da'i is Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And just as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu started doing the work of da'wah, the very day he became a Muslim and embraced Islam, he didn't wait to study aqidah, he didn't wait to learn even how to pray. He didn't learn any hadith or tafsil of any other issues. And the very first thing he did after becoming a Muslim was to give da'wah. And from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all the sahaba, when we look at their lives, whosoever used to embrace Islam, used to accompany the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this work of da'wah. Not just Sahaba from amongst the men, Allah has mentioned a story in the Quran about some of the jinns. A group of jinns, Allah directed them to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Allah blessed his, his beloved Prophet with the Nubuvat, uh, and before the beginning of a revelation, the jinns and shayateen used to rise to the heavens and listen to some of the conversations of the angels. Uh, because Allah gives orders to angels to carry out His will in this world. And so the angels discuss and talk about amongst themselves. So the jinn is used to rise and listen to their conversations and then come and report some of the affairs to some of the fortune tellers. And then these kahins, as they are known in Arabic, they would add more masala or spice to the issue and then corrupt other people or uh, again, the people who come to them. So when revelation started coming to the Prophet sallallahu and then to put in modern terms immigration was tightened in the heavens <laughs> the borders were secured more uh, like in this country many people 20-30 years ago didn't even need a visa you just got a ticket and you came to England you could get a visa at the border but now uh, things are much different you need a visa before they even allow you to get on the plane to come to England uh, similarly, the, the, the jinns and shayateen used to rise to the heavens, but after uh, revelation started coming to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when the jinns or shayateen would rise to the heavens, then the angels would chase them and drive them away. And so Iblis had a meeting, 
and to, with, his, uh, with his advisors and ministers, to put it in modern terms, to discuss and investigate why this change has occurred. So he sent his, his secret service out to different parts of the world. Uh, his MI5 version or CIA, whatever. <laughs> and then uh, he, sees, he, he sent them out to different parts of the world to see why this change has occurred. And one of these parties were originally from Nasibin. They had come to investigate. But Allah says, وَإِذْ صَرَفْنَا إِلَيْكَ نَفَرًا مِّنَ الْجِنِّ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقُرْآنِ I directed this group towards you. The Prophet ﷺ was returning from Taif and he was praying at a place. And when the Prophet ﷺ used to pray, it was his noble practice, he would raise his voice and he would, he would re or recite Quran in a hymning voice. So when the Prophet was reciting and praying, then these jinns happened to pass by. And when they passed by, يَسْتَمِعُونَ Quran. فَلَمَّا حَضَرُوهُ قَالُوا أَنْسِتُ And when they came across Rasulullah, they said, be quiet, listen attentively. فَلَمَّا قُضِيَ When the Prophet ﷺ completed his recitation, وَلَّوْا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ مُنْذِرِينَ Then they returned to their people as مُنْذِرِز Arabic is a very precise and subtle language. Sometimes the Fatha and the Kasra or the Dhamma, it changes the meaning to, to what... Uh, uh, it changes the meaning of a word. In Arabic, uh, one is munzir, one is munzar. Munzar is a person who is warned, and munzir is a person who is warning. The Prophet is Bashir, and also Mubashir. Uh, uh, and and uh, there's another word, Mubashar. Mubashar means whoever has been given the news. Mubashir, the one who gives the news. Mubashar, the one who has been given the news about. And similarly, Munzir is a warner and mun, a Munzar is a person who's warned. So Allah says, when, these, when the Prophet ﷺ completed his recitation, then these jinns would come from Nasibin. Nasibin is a province or an area in Iraq. And they'd come from there and, uh, and they return to their people. Allah says, Munzirin, with the intention of warning their people. They were jinns, they'd come and they, they saw the Prophet, they heard his recitation and they were so impressed and taken back. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't even become aware that these people have come, they've listened and they accepted the Prophet ﷺ's recitation. They believed in Rasulullah and then they were going back all at their own accord without, without any orders from Rasulullah ﷺ. And when they went back, to their people. Allah says, قَالُوا يَا قَوْمَنَا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا كِتَابًا أُنزِلَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مُوسَى they, get, they said to the people, now obviously the people weren't waiting, so they must have gathered them, done some gasht, like our Tablik brothers do, and, and they gathered them and they said, إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا كِتَابًا أُنزِلَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مُوسَى They said, we have heard a book which has been revealed after Musa. مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ uh, it testifies to what he had. Yahdi ila al-haqq wa ila tariqi mustaqim. It guides to the truth and the right path. Ya qawmana ajibu da'i Allah. O our people, respond and acknowledge the call of the caller to Allah. Wa aminu bihi and believe in him. Yaghfir lakum min zunubikum. He will forgive your sins. Wa yujirkum min azabin alim. And save you from a very painful punishment to come. Wa man la yujib da'i Allah. And whosoever doesn't acknowledge the call of the caller to Allah, فَلَيْسَ بِمُعْجِزٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَيْسَ لَهُ مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَا Then it won't do Allah any harm in any way. Uh, so they encourage the people to believe as well. And the main point is, here, the Prophet didn't instruct them. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't even aware at that instant. He became aware when Allah revealed Surah Jinn. قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَى نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا I tell them, it's been, it's been revealed to me that the, some of the jinns, they came and they heard the Qur'an and so on and they accepted. And so these jinns, at their own accord, they went and they started giving da'wah. And Sahaba used to give da'wah, jinns used to give da'wah. And Ibn Hajar Asqalani, rahmahullah, has written a book, Al-Isaba fi Tamizi Sahaba, and there he's... He's narrated a very interesting story about a, a very special jinn. 
Uh, his name was Hama. Hama bin Him bin Lahim bin Laqis bin Iblis. He was a great grandson of Iblis himself. And he came to Rasulullah and he said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, when Adam alayhi salam's two sons, uh, Habil and Qabil, fought each other, I was a young man. Thumma aslam tu ma'anuh. Then I embraced Islam at the hands of Nuh alayhi salam. Then I was with various different prophets, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, and Isa alayhi salam, and he told me, if I remain alive and you appear, I should convey you his salam. So, Ya Rasulullah, I convey you Hamaz, uh, I, I convey you Isa alayhi salam salam. As Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says, the Prophet left this world without informing us of the death of Hama. In other words, Hama lived from Adam alayhi salam's time till after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a possibility he might even still be alive. And as Aisha radiallahu anha says, the Prophet said, Hama fil Jannah. Hama will be in Jannah. Some ulama are of the opinions, jinns will not go to Jannah. Other ulama in light of Surah Ar-Rahman, because in Surah Ar-Rahman, Allah is addressing humans and jinns together, and there is extensive mention of, of, uh, of Jannah. And Allah says in the Quran, لَمْ يَتْمِثْهُنَّ إِنْسٌ قَبْلَهُمْ وَلَا جَان No man or jinn has ever touched them. So when humans will go, so from here, and they assume that jinns will also go to Jannah, but those who haven't been seen or observed by any jinns. So in light of, in light of this surah, some ulama are of the opinions that jinns will go to Jannah. Others are of the opinions jinns will not go to Jannah. And on the day of Qiyamat, after they've settled their account and reckoning, they will be ordered to turn into dust. But anyway, if they get to Jannah, good for them, but may Allah take us all there. Uh, if we get to Jannah, whether they get to Jannah or not, it's not going to take any Jannah away from us. Uh, so there's plenty space in Allah's Jannah for everybody, for all the humans and for all the jinns. Uh, but the case is, and uh, the Prophet wasallam said, Hama fil Jannah, Hama will be in Jannah. Uh, and in, in, in any case, uh, Mufassirin are of the opinion, even the dog who was with Ashab e Kaf, uh, even that dog will be given a human form and be allowed to enter into Jannah. So if a dog can enter Jannah, if Hama went, if Hama is also granted Jannah by Allah as an exception, then it's no problem. And some people say, well, all these narrations are da'if. Well, even if they are da'if, it's not a matter of our iman. Uh, it's a story. And in Bukhari, there is a narration. The Prophet said, Hadithu an Bani Israel wa la haraj. And there's no problem even narrating from Bani Israel. This is a hadith in Bukhari. So it's a problem for some people whether a hadith is sahih or da'if. Uh, but it wasn't a problem for Rasulullah. Uh, because obviously if the Bani Israel are going to narrate something, it's not going to be sahih. Uh, it will always remain doubtful. And so if the Prophet acknowledged it and permitted it, uh, so many Muslims who say we need only need sahih hadith, this is da'if, well this is not uh, what the Prophet wasallam has taught and approved, and this isn't a rule which was established by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in any case, it's just a story and it's no problem for us. It's an encouraging story, mashallah, an inspirational story. Allah, if Allah can guide the great grandson of Iblis, uh, then He shows there's plenty of hope for us, inshallah. Uh, Allah can guide us as well, providing we are sincere, we want guidance, and we want to come close to Allah. And Allah sees we are sincere, then Allah will have mercy upon us. And so I was saying, da'wah was done by Rasulullah, and that was his distinctive and prominent aspect of his personality. He was a da'i, he was sirajam munira, and, and, Allah, and the companions established da'wah, and, and accompanied the Prophet ﷺ in da'wah, and the jinns also did da'wah. And so da'wah is a very, very special amal. And there is nothing more pleasing to Allah than the amal of da'wah. So this is something we all need to do. And the ummah needs to do it as an ummah. And every individual needs to do it as well. Some people say, well, I don't need to join any group to do a da'wah. I can just do da'wah by myself. Well, that's not what the Qur'an says. And the Qur'an is encouraging us and to do da'wah collectively. وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ and just as when we pray, we, our deen is a collective deen. When we pray, we pray together. together. Uh, pray with those who pray. When the month of Ramadan comes, everybody, everybody fasts. When it's time for Hajj, everybody 
Everybody performs Hajj together. Yes, you can go on your own to Arafah, but everybody has to be in Arafah together. And Hajj is performed behind an Amir as well. Uh, so Dawah needs to be done collectively to be more effective and fruitful. Otherwise, if a person is doing Dawah individually, and uh, the Prophet said, Alaykum bil jama'ah. Uh, I command you that you must do things, you must remain with Jama'ah, with the group. Otherwise, just as shaitan eats up a lone sheep, uh, uh, just as a wolf eats up a lone sheep, uh, our wolf is shaitan. Uh, anyone doing anything individually, there is no guarantee he will be able to remain steadfast or do it even properly or effectively. But when people do it together, Yadullahi ala jamaa Allah's hand is on the Jamaat. Uh, so Dawah needs to be done collectively rather than individually. There are many things which the Prophet ﷺ has taught us and encouraged us to do something, set a goal, and then also, also described the methodology like prayer. Prayer is obligatory and we have been prescribed how to pray. Dawah has been encouraged but no specific method has been laid down for da'wah. Somebody, are you understand? And that if a person does da'wah in this manner only, it will be da'wah. If it is not done in this manner, now it will not be da'wah. The Prophet ﷺ himself did da'wah, Sahaba did da'wah, and many people are doing da'wah in different ways nowadays. Many people appreciate other brothers giving da'wah, but many brothers, what they are very critical of other people doing da'wah, and they think, no, this is bid'ah, and only the way we do it is real da'wah. And that is not, that, that, is, uh, that is a statement not supported by any evidence from the Qur'an, or the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ himself used to go around people, to their houses, to wherever people were, and whenever any opportunity came, the Prophet ﷺ used to give people da'wah, Yes, at the time, and when the Prophet used to give da'wah to people, they were non-Muslims. Abu Jahal and others, when Abu Bakr was given da'wah, he wasn't a Muslim at the time. So when the Prophet himself used to give da'wah, it was primarily to non-Muslims. And, but there is a difference between, uh, but there's a difference between the Muslims of now and the Muslims of the times of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Anybody who used to become a Muslim at the time of Rasulullah used to totally commit himself. There was no concept of a Muslim who was a Muslim but had his aqidah was anything but pure upon tawheed. There was no Muslim who was a Muslim but did not pray. There was no Muslim who claimed to be a Muslim but did not fast in the month of Ramadan. There was no Muslim who was a Muslim but and upon him whom zakat was obligatory and did not pay zakat. There was no Muslim in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam upon whom Hajj was obligatory but he did not perform Hajj. In fact, if a person upon whom Hajj is obligatory and he doesn't, the warning is very very severe. In hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he considered such people to be like Christians or Jews. In the Qur'an, Allah says, وَمَنْ كَفَرَ A person, وَلِلَّهِ يَلَ النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ إِسْتَطَعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا It's a right of Allah upon the people, those who, who can afford to perform hajj, that they should do so. And those who don't, Allah says, وَمَنْ كَفَرَ As though he's becoming a kafir or committing kufr. So there was no such concept of Muslims. Being Muslims and not even doing the fundamentals. When we look around us, it's the other way around. Uh, you will find very few Muslims who are Muslims, but actually, mashallah, they pray. And they pray properly. And they fast. And if zakat is obligatory, they pay zakat. <laughs> Subhanallah, some ulama have written, if all the rich people upon whom zakat is obligatory, if all the rich in this ummah paid only their obligatory zakat, then this will suffice all the poor people of the world. Or at least the poor Muslims of the world. And when we see there is poverty in the Muslims, it shows huh, that Muslims don't even pay their zakat properly. And in the time of Abu Bakr ta'ala anhu, he didn't just give da'wah, he made jihad against those who were refusing to pay zakat. Uh, so the fact that 
I pe- that some people are giving dawah to Muslims, many people think this is bid'ah or this is not right, this is not dawah, this is just tafkir or reminder, that's not the case. Uh, this is dawah as well, calling people to Allah, people who are Muslims uh, but don't believe in Allah properly and don't worship Allah and don't obey Allah, they need to be brought back to Allah, so that is also dawah ilallah. It's not da'wah ila islam but Allah doesn't restrict da'wah to da'wah ila islam Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ People who call people to Allah. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ This is my path, I call people to Allah. Not just to Islam, but to, to Allah. So da'wah needs to be to Allah. So whoever is giving da'wah to Allah is giving da'wah. Uh, so there's no need for people to say, uh, this is just a reminder, this is just a zikir. And that's their opinion, but in reality, anyone calling people to Allah, to believe in Allah, to worship Allah, to fear Allah, uh, this is all da'wah ilallah. And the fact that azan five times a day is for Muslims uh, in Makkah, Medina, Jerusalem, London, England, uh, Europe, Australia, America, everywhere, Allahumma rabba hadhi da'wah tamma. Some people think that giving da'wah to Muslims is bid'ah, it's not. Otherwise in the hadith it would not say, Allahumma rabba hadhi da'wah tamma. This is perfect da'wah. So perfect da'wah can also be for Muslims as well. And da'wah, huh? in another verse in the Quran, Allah has commanded people, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Because da'wah is such a wonderful amal, it needs to be done properly. And the most important thing in da'wah is hikmat. Allah doesn't say, Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil ilmi, with knowledge. Allah says bil hikmah. Hikmah is a part of knowledge. Uh, but there is a very subtle difference between hikmat and just knowledge. People can have knowledge of words and phrases, but lack wisdom, lack hikmah. And in fact, what they can then do is to discourage people, put people off. Uh, and in da'wah, uh, people need to be very mindful to do it with wisdom in a manner yassiru wa la tu'assiru, bashiru wa la tunafiru that they make things easy for people and not difficult and they encourage people and don't put them off. Uh, in da'wah, it's very important uh, to, be, to take it easy with people, uh, to be very lenient with people and to give da'wah politely and softly. Uh, Allah has mentioned this in the Quran as well. When Allah sent Musa alayhi salam, and at his request, Allah gave him permission to take Harun alayhi salam with him as well. And Allah blessed Harun alayhi salam with Nubuvat. And when they were going to Fir'aun, Allah commanded them, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلَ اللَّيِّنَا When you speak to Fir'aun, speak very softly. So da'wah, the tone and the nature of da'wah should always be soft. Uh, because softness uh, in courage brings people closer and harshness uh, it will repel people, it will push them away. Uh, so with dawah you need to be soft, you need to bring people close. Once at the time of Mamun Rashid, someone gave him advice very harshly. And Mamun, he said to this person, I might be sinful but I'm not as bad as Fir'aun. You might be very good but you're not as good as Musa. Allah sent someone better than you to someone worse than me and commanded him to speak politely. So speak to me politely, please. فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلَ اللَّيْجِنَا Implying Allah sent Musa and Harun alayhi salam and no matter how great a scholar, a muhaddis, a faqih, whatever, uh, he can't be as good as Musa alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam wasn't just a nabi, he was one of the mighty messengers of Allah. And Firaun wasn't just a kafir, he was one of the worst kafirs ever. He claimed divinity for himself. Ana rabbukumul ala. I am your ultimate Lord. I am your ultimate God. So Allah sent Musa alayhi salam, one of the mighty messengers of Allah, uh, to one of the mightiest kafirs, and yet told him, commanded him, speak politely. فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلَ اللَّيْجِنَا uh, So the people who are engaged in the work of da'wah, they need to understand that da'wah is really effective and really da'wah if it's done with wisdom and politely uh, and softly. Uh, then it will be fruitful and subhanallah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, his life, Allahu Akbar, his nature, personality was so soft 
Allah has mentioned this as a special favor even to Rasulullah. Allah says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ Oh my beloved Prophet, do you not see what a special mercy of mine it was upon you that I made you so soft. Uh, that the fact that you are soft is, so, is, a, is a rahmat of Allah. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَزَّنْ غَلِيزَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ If you had been severe and harsh, people would have never flocked around you. Uh, people flock around you because they know you are soft. And any sahabi, anybody who would come, even from villages, and they had so much confidence, they could talk to Rasulullah wasallam without any hesitation. Although uh, people who were around Rasulullah wasallam, Allah then eventually taught them uh, very subtle, delicate etiquettes of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Oh you people, uh, when the Prophet is present, لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله Don't raise your voice. لا ترفعوا سواتكم فوق صوت النبي When my Prophet is present, don't raise your voice. Don't, uh, don't give yourself a preference on top of my Prophet. And don't come to his house either. لا تدخلوا بيوت النبي إلا أن يوزن لكم uh, only go to his house if you are called. If he takes you home to entertain you, give you something to eat or feed you, as soon as you've eaten, فَانْتَشِرُوا وَلَا مُسْتَأْنِسِينَ لِحَدِيثِ Don't hang about. If you want to see my Prophet, and don't call him out of his home, uh, just, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا حَتَّى تَخْرُجَ إِلَيْهِمْ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُونَكَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحُجُرَاتِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَاقِلُونَ It's not fitting for any Muslim or a believer or a man in his senses to call Rasulullah out of his home. Wait for him to come out yourself. And Allah had given Rasulullah such an per- awesome personality. Uh, there's a narration mentioned in Mishkat when Sahaba was sitting with the, with the Prophet, uh, they couldn't even look into his eyes. Uh, such awesome personality Rasulullah had, they would look down. And only Abu Bakr and Umar, Allahu Akbar, and they would look in, onto Rasulullah, the Prophet would look at them, they would smile at him and he would smile at them. Allahu Akbar. And then Allah forbid Sahaba, Ya Yulladin Amanu, La Tasalu Anashia in Tubadalakum Tasukum. Don't just ask my Prophet any question. If he gives you an answer, you might not like it. And it might make things more difficult to you. And just wait for him to teach you. And whatever Allah sees fit, Allah will reveal and he will teach you. So Sahaba used to say, we used to wait for some Arabi, some villager, some Baddu to come and ask Rasulullah because they would have no fear. And they would just come and say anything to Rasulullah. And the Prophet ﷺ was very mindful of them as well. Once a Baddu came, Arabi, and he came and he started urinating in the masjid. Sahaba rushed to warn him that the Prophet said, no, no, leave him, it's too late now. He's already started, so let him. Let him finish, otherwise it will cause him problem. And when he finished, and the Prophet said to him very softly, politely, kindly, Allah has forbidden us from urinating in the masajid. And these are houses of Allah. And he ordered the Sahaba to pour some water over it. Uh, and But subhanallah. Once a Sahabi came to Rasulullah, I said, Ya Rasulullah, allow me, give me permission to commit zina. You can imagine how Sahaba felt. He's asking permission to commit zina. Uh, and uh, the Prophet kept everybody calm and the Prophet then addressed him. Uh, when you commit zina, uh, the woman that you have this affair with, uh, she will be somebody's mother. Do you want anyone committing zina with your mother? No, Ya Rasulullah. Well, she'll be somebody's mother. Do you want someone to commit zina to your sister, with your sister? No, the woman you have zina with, she'll also be somebody's sister. People don't want anybody to make zina with their sisters. Do you want someone to make zina with your daughter? No, Ya Rasulullah. Well, She'll also be somebody's daughter. They don't want it either. And then the Prophet ﷺ put his noble hand on his chest and prayed for him. And then Allah removed all that evil desire from his heart. And Sahabi used to say, well, the Prophet never, he didn't tell me off. Uh, he wasn't harsh with me. And he, see, he addressed me so politely and softly. Uh, so teachers and callers, uh, this is the nature of da'wah, to be soft and polite. Uh, Allahu Akbar. Uh, and to give da'wah, Allahu Akbar, in, in, in. And so da'wah is an obligation on every individual, and da'wah is an obligation unto the whole ummah, and it is something which needs to be done collectively as well, for it to be effective, and for the person himself. If a person is giving da'wah individually, 
and he happens to be giving dawah to a Christian for example, and the Christian then happens to be very knowledgeable, then there is a danger, then that person might be able to come back to him and in, in a manner, shake his iman and create doubts in his mind. But if a person is doing it collectively, there will be people around to support him and, and save him should he be in that danger. And so people who are often doing dawah on their own, and then what happens then shaitan many times gets the better of them, and then they can easily be taken off. Uh, so dawah needs to be done collectively, and it needs to be done softly, and it needs to be done with wisdom. Uh, and dawah, Allahu Akbar, Allah has promised so much reward on dawah, dawah uh, is invitation. There is a subtle difference between dawah and talim. Education and, and invitation. Many people consider talim, education to also be dawah. That is also very virtuous and also very good. Uh, but dawah is subtly different to talim and to education. Education is given to those, or talim is given to those who want to learn. If a person wants to pray but doesn't know how to pray, he goes to someone, brother, can you teach me uh, to how to pray properly? Now. The person who teaches this person to pray properly, as long as this person will carry on praying, Allah will give him the reward, and the person who taught him how to pray, Allah will give him the reward as well. But, but there's a difference. This person wanted to know how to pray. So he went to someone and got someone to teach him. Or he bought a book and started learning. But there's another person, he doesn't want to pray. So you can teach him how to pray, but it doesn't mean he'll pray because he doesn't want to pray. So dawah is encouraging that person who doesn't want to pray or doesn't realize its importance in making him understand so that he will start to pray. This is dawah. By encouragement, uh, by targheeb, uh, by inspiration, to encourage that person to start to pray. And not just to start to pray, a person, mashallah, Allahu Akbar, may Allah guide us all and save us all. If a person isn't following the right path, it may be a Muslim or even a non-Muslim. A non-Muslim doesn't know about Islam, doesn't know about Allah, doesn't know about Rasulullah. So somebody gave him dawah and encouraged him to come to Islam and believe in Allah and then obey Allah and then carry on living his life the way Allah wants him to live. This is also dawah. But there's another person, he's already a Muslim, but he's a negligent Muslim. He doesn't come to the masjid, he doesn't pray, he does, he's not careful about what he eats, who he associates with and so on, how he makes his livelihood. Now this person is supposedly a Muslim, but is living a life of negligence. Uh, another person who's practicing goes to him and makes him aware, encourages him. And to fear Allah, to believe in Allah, start to worship Allah, start to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and then this person gives him encouraging, encouraging, mashal, in, encouragement, and makes him realize and fear Allah, that if he was to die in this state, how will he stand and rise in the presence of Allah on the day of Qiyamah? And how will, he, how will he justify what he's been doing? And then this person, he then repents, realizes and repents and changes his life. This person encouraged him to repent and change his ways and to start obeying Allah and, and worshipping Him. Might have taken him 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour or many visits at a time. Now when this person repents or comes into Islam, then whatever that person will ever do in terms of his, the, the knowledge he acquires, the prayers he prays, the fasting he fasts, the charity he gives, the hajj that he does, or any other good that person will ever do in his life, uh, all Allah will reward him for doing good, but the person who became the source of his guidance by giving him dawah, Allah will give him all that collective reward of all the good things that person will ever do. And then suppose this person who then repented and became good, then carries on spreading the good word to other people, members of his family, his friends and others, then all the good which results because of him, Allah will give him the reward. But suppose he encouraged five, six other people as well, then all the collective reward will go into the account of the person who gave the initial da'wah, or that encouragement. The difference between talim, for example, you might 
you might teach someone to pray might take you many hours to help that person perfect his pronunciation and to do wudu properly and so on. But Allah will give you the reward of all that effort. But the caller, the one giving da'wah, it might take him half an hour or, an, or, or a number of visits or a number of meetings with a person and to encourage him to change his life altogether. And then whatever that person does, all that collective reward will go into the account of the person who became the source. So the reward upon da'wah is much, much more than what any person can acquire from any other deed. A person prays, he's doing his own prayer, mashallah, Allah will reward him for his own prayer. But one doesn't know if his, his prayer, his own personal prayer is acceptable or not. But you teach someone to pray properly, and then whenever that person will pray, whether his prayer is acceptable or not, Allah will give you the reward of his as though complete prayer, because at the end of the day you can only teach him how to pray. How he prays, you are not responsible. Uh, but you will only be rewarded for his prayer. But a person who gives da'wah, he will be rewarded for everything that person does. So the reward for da'i uh, is endless. Is endless. And Allahu Akbar. So, you know, da'wah is something which is an obligation. And da'wah, just as fasting and salat and zakat and hajj has been ordained by Allah. Allah gave these orders, Aqibu salah, it's in the Qur'an, Atu zakat, give zakat, perform hajj, kutiba alaykum usiyam, from Allah, similarly da'wah is from Allah, is from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, so a Muslim doesn't, uh, doesn't need to think, oh this is from so and so group, they are doing da'wah, so it's their affair, not my affair. No, this is a part of our deen, it's a part of our iman, just as salat is a command of Allah, so is da'wah a command of Allah. And when we see from in different parts of the world, obviously there are different brothers, mashallah, doing da'wah in different modes. Some people, mashallah, they do stalls, uh, as many of the brothers from the Quran project, or, they, or they, they put up a table on a high street, and they put up some brochures, and pe people passing by, they give them, that is da'wah, alhamdulillah, may Allah reward them as well. Uh, many people... MashaAllah, they join, for example, people, uh, brothers from Tabliq Jamaat. And they go around from masjid to masjid, for example, and visiting people from door to door, and doing da'wah in this way. And many people, MashaAllah, join them, many people are critical of them. And many people go as far as condemning them and rejecting them, that this is all bidah. That is not the case. And that is not the case. And the Prophet and, and they say, well, the Prophet wasallam did not do da'wah in this fashion, he didn't do da'wah for three days or for 40 days or going from door to door from Muslim to Muslims' houses. Well, the Prophet ﷺ did go from door to door visiting people's houses and going in Mina. Uh, when people used to come to Hajj, going from camp to camp, from tent to tent, giving people da'wah. And like I explained early, in the time of Rasulullah ﷺ, anybody who became a Muslim was a completely devoted, sincere, practicing Muslim. Many of our Muslim brothers nowadays, uh, they are Muslims, but they don't practice. Uh, in fact, da'wah to them is much, much more important than, in, than extending our da'wah even to non-Muslims. And I'll give you Dalil, an example. In an Islamic Khilafah, if there was an Islamic Khilafah somewhere, and there were hundreds or thousands or millions of Kafirs living in an Islamic state, in an Islamic state with the Khalifa, then the Muslims, can they force these people to become Muslims? No, la ikraha fi deen. There is no compulsion in deen. You can't force people to become Muslims. But, if one person who is a Muslim decides to go the other way, and become a kafir or a murtad. You know what the ruling is regarding that? Uh, the rule, one of the most severe rulings is regarding a person who becomes an apostate or becomes a murtad, leaves Islam and chooses something else. Uh, so we are obliged to ensure that no Muslim ever falls into this trap and leaves Islam. 
And in fact, not just leave Islam, the Prophet ﷺ said, Man ra'a minkum munkaran fal yughayyirhu biyadi. If you see anyone doing something evil, stop it with your hand. Fa'illam yastate fa bilisani. If you can't change it, not just stop it, change it. Some people are very critical and what they do, they object and they criticize and they argue and it makes the situation even worse. The Prophet didn't say stop. The Prophet said, Fal yughayyiru. Uh, yughayyiru means change it. The person is doing something bad, help him to change and become better so he stops doing that bad. Now again, here, if, if a person is critical and becomes harsh, then that person will then defend his action. So here again, we find that here again, you need to be soft. Uh, you need to have wisdom in order to encourage that person uh, to, ch- to leave the bad that he's doing and then accept good. فَلْيُغَيِّرُ بِيَدِ فَإِلَّمْ يَسْتَطِفَ بِلِسَانِ وَإِلَّمْ يَسْتَطِفَ بِقَلْبِ And then the Prophet ﷺ gave a third option. The first, to change it physically. If not, then to reason with that person and to make him aware and explain to him uh, with your tongue uh, so that he will stop doing the wrong that he's doing and become good. And if you find that even that will be not practical and not fruitful, then at least you should feel bad in your heart. And this is the lowest form of Iman. And if a person sees someone doing something bad and goes along with it and accepts it or even approves it, Allahu Akbar, then this shows that that person doesn't have any Iman. Uh, So as we were saying, Allah says in the Quran that there should be an Ummat. And when we see uh, in all the people who are doing the work of Dawah, different people are doing work in different ways, uh, but the people doing work in the form of an Ummat in this time and age are Tablighi Jamaat. Uh, they have their Amir, an Ummat uh, has an Amir. As a Jamaat has an Amir, Tablighi Jamaat brothers have an Amir. And mashallah, they have p- people who are engaged with them. And assisting them, mashallah, will be part of them from all over the world. In fact, in the history of Islam, in the history of Islam, you will find uh, after the Karni Ula, uh, uh, after the initial age, you will find there isn't anything as global as Tabligh. People from the east to the west and the north and the south, in every country, in every continent, in every city, mashallah, who are, who are collectively assisting one another, helping one another, and engaged in the amal of da'wah, helping one another uh, in, in, in this effort, mashallah, engaged in the work of da'wah. So if this wasn't uh, acceptable to Allah, Allah, Allah wouldn't have put this acceptance generally uh, in the ummah as it is. So these are signs of qubuliyat from Allah. Allah has accepted this effort and the sacrifices of these brothers and that people, Allahu Akbar, f- throughout the world, from every nation, in every country, uh, in most masajids of the world, brothers are doing the work of da'wah collectively uh, at the same sort of level, at the same, same sort of standard, Allahu Akbar. Uh, with encouragement, uh, as the Prophet ﷺ said, يَسِّرُوا وَلَا تُوَسِّرُوا بَشِّرُوا وَلَا تُنَفِّرُوا In tabligh, uh, people get together and they encourage one another by giving targheeb and fadail, as the brothers say. Hence the book they use, fadail amal Some people say, well, Tablighi brothers, uh, they regard fadail amal like the Qur'an. That is nonsense. Nobody re- uh, considers any book like the Qur'an. Qur'an is the absolute word of Allah. And nobody anywhere considers any book like the Qur'an. Uh, but... In tabligh, when people go out, for example, with the brothers, they only read from fazal amal and there are very good sound reasons for doing that. Uh, because generally people who go in tabligh are uh, people from all sorts of backgrounds. They need encouragement, encouragement uh, to become good and to change their lives. And as a result, Shaykh Al-Adis rahimahullah has compiled a hadith uh, which are encouraging, which have targheeb in them. Uh, many of those hadiths are from Bukhari, many from Muslim and Sahasitta and from other books of hadith. Many brothers, Allahu Akbar, may Allah guide them. Uh, and, uh, and out of, if I was to say, ignorance or rather foolishness, uh, they say, Tablik, 
A fazal amal is full of fabricated stories. Allahu Akbar. If this was to be taken literally, that means every statement is fabricated. Shaykh al Rahimahullah in fazal amal whenever he has started any chapter, he begins with quotations, verses from the Qur'an. Are these verses of Qur'an fabricated? Na'uzubillah. Many hadiths are from Bukhari, many hadiths from Sahih Muslim, other Sahih Sitta. And the Shaykh has written a commentary uh, under every hadith describing his status, uh, whether it's sahih or da'if. And because uh, even if some of, some of the ha- hadith are da'if, then it's no problem. Uh, even the grand muhaddisun, Imam Tirmizi, Imam Nisai, Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah, Imam Abdul Razak and others, they've all brought hadiths, sahih and da'if in their compilations. Imam Bukhari in a sahih Bukhari, has made a, taken a particular measure or stance uh, to bring only Sahih Hadiths, but he's written other books as well in which he's compiled non Sahih Hadiths as well. Some Sahih, some even fabricated Hadiths. In Tariq Kabir, uh, in Adab al Mufrid as well, uh, there is a, uh, a Hadith which is, which is going around in many circles, uh, supposedly attributed to Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anu, uh, uh, through Imam Bukhari, that Imam Bukhari uh, wrote. A small pamphlet, it's entitled small booklet entitled Juz Rafa Yadain, in which he has tried to prove the validity of raising one's hands before Ruku and after Ruku. And this is an accepted issue, the Prophet ﷺ has done it. But Imam Bukhari supposedly has brought a narration from Abdullah bin Umar in which uh, it is stated that he would throw pebbles at people who were not raising their hands before Ruku and after Ruku. Ibn Hajar Asqalan in Fatul Bari has rejected this as being fabricated. Imam Bukhari has presented it, Ibn Hajar Asqalan has rejected it as being fabricated because there is evidence that Abdullah ibn Umar in Sahih narration, in Sahih Abu Awana, in Imam Tahawi's compilation, Sharaman al Athar, with Sahih narration, it's been proven there were occasions Abdullah ibn Umar himself himself did not use to raise his hands before Ruku and after Ruku on occasions. And so Ibn Hajar Asqalani has, has uh, given the interpretation كَانَ فَعَلَهُ تَارَةً وَتَرَكَهُ أُخْرَى that Ibn Umar, he would raise his hands occasionally and not on other occasions. So when he himself doesn't do it regularly and always, how can he expect and command others to do it? So this hadith, this narration, if it is accepted, and if Juz Rafa Yadan is attributed correctly to Imam Bukhari, then it proves Imam Bukhari himself even has presented fabricated hadiths like this. But in another, in, in other, in, in a, on other occasions, Tariq Kabir, Adab al Mufrid, is presented even daif hadiths. It's generally accepted by ulama. So if Shaykh Waladis Mawlana Zakriya Rahimahullah has also presented some da'if hadiths which don't contradict the Qur'an, which don't contradict Sahih hadiths of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are merely there for encouragement, then that is no problem. Uh, some people, have, it's, they've made it a problem for themselves. As I quoted a hadith earlier from Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has even quoted has been reported to have said, Haddisu am Bani Israel wala haraj. Even narrate from the Bani Israel, no problem. And what did the Bani Israel used to narrate? Stories. So some people have got serious problem with Fazale Amal. There are fabricated stories. How do you know they are fabricated? And in any case, they're only stories. So when the Prophet's got no problem with accepting stories, then why have you got a problem if Shaykh al Rahimahullah has written and quoted and compile some stories. No one is asking you to base your aqidah on them, to base your ahkams or afra'id and wajibat or rulings upon them. They are only stories for encouragement, no problem. And the purpose of stories is encouragement. Allah says in the Quran to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, that, وَكُلَّنَّ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ that we only narrate these stories to you of previous prophets to affirm you. Uh, so stories of other people, especially prophets, uh, they affirm a person, they make him stronger. And these similarly stories are there to serve that purpose, to give people encouragement. And uh, they are the prophet didn't say uh, they are fabricated. Allah didn't say in the Quran they are fabricated. Whether it's a fabricated issue or a daif issue is a man, it's a, it's a question of opinion of different people. 
And so in Fadal Amal, uh, which is a wonderful book, Alhamdulillah, and Allah has given this book, book acceptance. And after the Quran, probably Fadal Amal is the most read book in the whole world. People read it in every masjid almost, mashallah, in most houses it's read. And millions of people have benefited from reading Fadal Amal. And people continue to do so. So when people go in khuruj in jamaat, for example, they read from Fazal Amal only. Uh, this doesn't mean that they discourage people uh, from learning. No! When people go in jamaat, uh, they are encouraged to learn everything. Uh, aqidah issues, fiqh issues, qirat issues, all sorts of issues. Uh, but when they return from the khuruj and they go back to their own localities, learn from their own ulama. Because in Khuruj, there are people from all sorts of backgrounds. If you start discussing complicated issues, it causes problems. And many people in Jamaat are not ulama. And so it causes disputes. So in order to avoid these disputes and arguments, and the elders of Tabligh have, read, have, have laid a rule. Uh, when you're in Khuruj, only read from Fazal Amal or Riyadh Salihin, because this will encourage people. And in these books, there are hadiths. Verses from the Quran which are encouraging and inspirational. And in any case, uh, the, the time people spend in khuruj, uh, that is a period to learn and improve, like a spiritual training, uh, to give up one's bad habits to and acquire good habits and good practices. When a person is out in khuruj, it's like a treatment period, training period. You can compare it like someone who becomes ill and then is admitted to hospital. When he's gone to the hospital, he's going through a planned sequence of treatment. And the doctor might say, well, in this time, please refrain from eating sugar, red meat, and this and that. And the person doesn't say, who are you to tell me? You don't even believe in Allah. Allah has made it halal, so how can you tell me not to eat it? When Allah has made it halal, you will tell him, brother, it's halal, but in your present state, it's harmful for you. You've got diabetes, if you eat too much sugar, it's going to harm you. Allah has made lamb halal, but in your present state of illness, red meat's not good for you. Uh, so you have to refrain from eating until you recover. So similarly, issues, there's loads of issues very important, but when people are in khuruj, it can do them more harm to discuss and learn those issues in, at that particular time. So the elders have said, don't talk about these issues while you are in khuruj. When you complete your three days, ten days, forty days, whatever, then you go back uh, to your masjids, go to your ulama, who are properly learned, learn these issues from him, so that he will explain it to you properly. And other brothers have got problems, brothers three days, ten days, uh, subhanallah, wait uh, forty days, and this is all bidah. Where did they get this from? Allahu Akbar, brothers. Allah has mentioned a fundamental issue in the Quran. Man ja'a bil hasanati falahu ashru amthaliha. Those whosoever does a good deed, Allah will multiply its reward by ten. So if a person spends three days regularly in the path of Allah, every month, then it's as though he spent the whole month thirty days in the path of Allah. And forty days, Allah says in the Quran, Allah could have made Musa Islam do two months or one month. But Allah has made it Wawa Adna Musa Arbaina Laylatan. Allah made Musa Islam complete forty days on tour before Allah gave him Torah. And four months, Allah says in the Quran, after the conquest of Makkah, after the conquest of Makkah, the Makkans were allowed four months. Fasihu fil ardi arba'ata ashur. And they were allowed four months to remain with the Muslims because it gave them the opportunity to see the, the lives of Muslims interact with them. Allah could have sent from, from today, you have to leave. But no, Allah gave them four months. Because living for four months in that good environment with Muslims, it was bound to influence and affect them and bring them to Islam. So when people go uh, for four months or whatever in the path of Allah, being in that environment, it brings about a good change. And in a hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has also, has also described the development of, of an embryo in different stages of 40-40 days. It remains nutfa for 40 days, then becomes alaqa, then mudgha. And then after four months, the soul, the ruh is brought into that development. And the, and the child begins to move and become alive. 
So when a person spends 40 days, uh, it, and, and there are many other hadiths as well. Uh, when one hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said, "Man akhlasa lillahi arba'ina yawman," whosoever spares 40 days for the sake of Allah, then Allah will fill his heart with wisdom. So doing 40 days and 4 months, this has evidence from the Qur'an and from the, uh, from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. And so as such, uh, this is no problem. And in any case, they don't regard it to be farad or wajib. And anybody who doesn't do 4 months and 40 days is a kafir, nauzubillah, or a fasiq or whatever. This is encouragement. And just like in, it, it doesn't say in the hadith that you have to go to Medina University for 4 years to become a scholar. And people used to come to Medina and become scholars in few weeks. Ah. In few weeks, people would become become scholars and, and gain a thorough knowledge, understanding of deen. Ah, so, four months or forty days, whatever, this isn't farad or wajib, this is a tartib. And Shaykh Uthaymeen, who is one of the selfish scholars, uh, 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 one of the prominent Saudi ulama, he was asked the same question. And he said, brother, this is only tertib, there's no problem for a tertib. This is not the end result or the desired effect. And this is only to keep people going and learning and, and so on. So it brings about a good change in people. The end result is to strengthen one's iman and to learn to do da'wah and to learn to live for the sake of Allah. Like in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, people used to recite Qur'an, but there was no Qur'an in the book form. People used to learn and teach hadith, but there was no Bukhari, there was no Muslim, there was no Tirmizi, Nisai, Abu Dawood. Uh, so similarly, had learning hadith or learning knowledge is important, but the Prophet hasn't specified a specific method. Uh, so giving da'wah is a responsibility of every Muslim to do da'wah collectively, to learn the wisdom of da'wah, to be able to do it softly and nicely and in an effective way, which is really only possible when done collectively in the form of jama'ah. When we see Matamligi Jama'at in this time and age at least is the only jama'at who is doing da'wah in this manner. And just because they are doing work for amongst Muslims primarily, and people are mistaken that they don't give da'wah to kafir. They don't go out to give da'wah to kafirs, but if somebody comes to them, they don't throw him away either. Uh, they target the Muslims primarily, uh, and so on. Uh, because if, because like we gave an example, uh, to safeguard the iman of a Muslim is far, far more important than to bring a non-Muslim into Islam. That is also important, don't get me wrong. Uh, but the fact that a person is already Muslim, he needs to be given such encouragement and support to ensure that he remains as Muslim. Some brothers, uh, they also criticize Tablighi by saying that Tablighi brothers, uh, they apply ayats of jihad upon Tablighi. And they misquote ayats of jihad by applying them on Tablighi. That, that, that implies for Qital. Now in Arabic, there are two different words. Qital and Jihad are two different words. They have two different meanings. And Jihad in Arabic means a struggle. It may involve fighting. And, but Qital is clearly fighting. And, uh, and Allah gave the Muslims permission to fight. أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا Allah has given permission to Muslims uh, to fight because they've been wronged. Uh, so permission was given to fight and we need be to kill the people who kill you or fight you. Uh, but there is another terminology, jihad, which is used throughout the Quran to describe simply a struggle. And the struggle to spread Islam is the greatest form of jihad. Uh, with evidence and the lead from the Quran. Not a da'if hadith from fazal e amal uh, from the Quran. And uh, there is a surah in the 18th Jews. Uh, 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 it's entitled Surah Al-Furqan. It goes on to the 19th Jews as well. And this surah, if you open the Quran on the 18th Jews, is Surah Al-Furqan Makkiyatun. See? Surah Al-Furqan Makkiyatun. It was revealed in Makkah Al-Mukarramah. Now in Makkah Al-Mukarramah, there was no qital. Qital was only ordained when the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Makkah to Medina and Muslims were allowed just before the battle of Badr. So in this surah there is a verse, Allah says, وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا 
Uh, this is Surah 25 verse 52. 25 the other way around 52. Surah 25 verse 52. وَجَاهِدُهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا kabira And struggle with them the greatest struggle. And that struggle was in Makkah al And that struggle was in the form of da'wah, in the form of tabligh. So tabligh is a bigger jihad than the, than, than the fighting jihad. Because Allah says it's big. In Makkah there was no qital. Yes, when the need rises for people to go and make qital, then that is an also an obligation that needs to be addressed as well. But such need to fight, uh, that is a temporary or a momentary issue. They, they, they might be in need at a particular time. Once that need is fulfilled, then, then that's it. Then when another opportunity arises, then there will be kital again. Uh, but dawah and tabligh is a continuous struggle and it is required all the time. Hence Allah has made this struggle and termed it as the bigger jihad. وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا kabira. So if da'wah and tabligh is the bigger jihad, so whatever has been mentioned with regard to jihad in Qur'an or Hadith, will it not fit the bigger form of jihad? Of course it will fit the bigger form of jihad. But people who want to criticize, and they will criticize everything left, right and center. Uh, once a man, he drew a picture and he put it up on the main road. Uh, with the heading, if you see anything wrong, please list underneath. So by the end of the first day, there was a long list. Uh, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, and that's wrong as well. Then the next day, he changed the notice. If you see anything wrong, please correct it. He remained up for six months, not a single correction. So when, other pe- when people see others doing something, everybody can see a lot of faults in others. And there is a saying, you know, the, the big bundle of hair on top of one's eyes. Yeah? One can see a single hair in somebody else's eyes, but you can't see the big bundle on top of your own eyes. And when you point one finger at someone, then three fingers point back at you. It's easy to point fingers at others, but when you point a finger at someone, there are three pointing back at you. So when we see faults in others, that means we ourselves have three times as many faults. So it's easy to point fingers at others, uh, but to show and do something practically, uh, these brothers, Allahu Akbar, uh, from the east to the west and the north and the south, Allahu Akbar, all over the world doing fundamental, basic, crucial, important work in bringing people back to deen. Many people say, oh, these, these people, they don't know their aqidah. And they do bidah. The word aqidah doesn't even appear in the Quran. It doesn't even appear in any sahih hadith. Uh, what appears in the Qur'an is Iman and Yaqeen. And Tablighi brothers are the only people who talk about Iman and Yaqeen. Other people have, brother, you got to learn Aqeedah. Okay, you got to learn Aqeedah. But that's not what Allah says in the Qur'an. In the Qur'an, Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, aminu, believe, have Iman. So Tablighi brothers, Allahu Akbar, everything in Tablighi, if a person was sincere, Allahu Akbar, you will see the evidence in Qur'an and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But other people, subhanallah, it's easy to criticize and people haven't even spared Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from criticism. And people even, even called Ali radiallahu ta'ala, and supposed people who used to recite la ilaha illallah and base their evidence from Qur'an labeled Ali radiallahu anhu as a kafir. By quoting, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ أَوْمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Oh Ali, you have taken Abu Musa Ashari and, uh, and Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu as an arbitrator to provide a solution. Uh, obviously they are not Allah and you have let them legislate and you have let them make a decision so you're a kafir now, Zubillah. So people haven't spared the Khulfa Rashidu, they didn't spare Rasulullah, and they haven't even spared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People are even critical of Allah. So just because someone is critical, it doesn't mean he's necessarily right. Uh, so alhamdulillah, the brothers are doing good work, and from in all parts of the world, and, and mashallah, yes, there are weak narrations in fazal amal and so on, uh, but that doesn't mean that they are unacceptable, if it, if it was unacceptable to present a weak narrations, then Imam Bukhari is similarly guilty. And just Imam Bukhari has presented these hadiths, does that mean you reject everything that Bukhari has done? Uh, so, so, Alhamdulillah, Tabligh 
in this time and age is a special mercy and rahmat of Allah upon the ummah which is helping to unite the ummah and keep it together and revive and reform deen. Uh, it's easy to stand outside and criticize the anything. But then to be involved and then to see and many a people who were critical but they've gone with the bleak and seen for themselves Allahu Akbar. Allah has removed uh, their doubts. Uh, many people think, oh, I used to be with Tabliq, but now I've seen what they're up to really, so I've left them. Just because someone has left Tabliq, it doesn't prove anything either. Uh, one of the Prophet's own cousins, Ubaidullah bin Jash, he became a Muslim in Mecca, migrated to Medina, became a Murtad in Abyssinia. Ubaidullah bin Jash, he was married to Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha. And when he became a Murtad and died in that state, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a message. Uh, and and uh, the Prophet ﷺ was married to Ummi Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha. So just because uh, a person has left da'wah, it doesn't mean da'wah is wrong or tabligh is wrong. Uh, that person might have, you can say, Allah threw him out. Allah didn't, Allah didn't like the way he was doing uh, tabligh or whatever. Allah took it away from him, just as Allah takes tawfiq away from people. So just because someone has been critical or thinks he was in tabligh and he's left them now, he's seen things in a better way, doesn't necessarily mean... <laughs> He is seeing things in a better way. He is, could be seeing things in a worse way. But many people continue, alhamdulillah, and to understand and improve and learn and become better Muslim and help other people as well. And Allahu Akbar. And in this way, it's bringing the ummah together. Um, most people are just criticizing and throwing people out. And Tabliq brothers are bringing people in, alhamdulillah. Uh, may Allah give us tawfiq uh, to do whatever is right and stay on the, on the right path and may Allah keep us on Islam as long as we live and when our time comes to leave this world may Allah take us away on Iman أرجو رضاك يا الله أنت الرحيم يا الله